Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Coffee and Headlines, our morning get-together live here on, on Facebook. Blah. Well, not so live today. This is a pre-recorded edition of our broadcast. This is Friday, October the 20th in the morning. In real time, I am actually on my way to Guadalajara to enjoy a nice weekend. But of course, as you know, we don't like to leave without leaving something prepared for you to enjoy. So I hope this morning finds you happy to embrace the weekend and happy uh, because it's Friday. <clears throat> thank God it's And thank God it's Friday. Thank God another weekend is here, an opportunity to rest and relax. And for me to go back to our capital city again. Yes. And I'm going to tell you why by just giving you a little bit of the lay of the land. Here it is our beautiful metropolitan area, Guadalajara, and the number of municipalities that are around it. Now, usually when I come to Guadalajara, I usually take the bus and get off at the Zapopan bus terminal, which allows me the opportunity to then head into the downtown area, is where, which is where I stay more often than not, because most of the things that I'm interested in can be found within walking distance in the downtown area. Of course, a couple of trips ago, we decided to be adventurous, adventurous and we stayed in the Zapopan downtown area, Zapopan being one of the municipalities that surrounds Guadalajara City. And uh, we spent all our time there and it was like going to a completely different city, which was very, very exciting. And for this trip, we are doing something similar. Uh, we are instead staying in downtown Tlaquepaque. So for the first time in a long time, I'm going to take the bus to Guadalajara and instead of getting off in uh, Zapopan, I'm going to take the bus all the way into the fairly new main bus terminal from which I can take the subway and end up just three or four blocks away from the hotel where we're staying. And you're probably wondering, well, why? Why Tlaquepaque? Well, despite the fact that it is located within the Guadalajara metropolitan area, Tlaquepaque was named a Pueblo Mágico in 2018, and rightly so. It is recognized for being one of Mexico's largest and most important artisan, art, artisanal destinations, and it is renowned for the level of craftsmanship available there. One of its main throughways, Andador Independencia, which we can see here, is actually a pedestrian-only walkway, which means you can walk for many blocks, exploring a number of art galleries, gift shops, and many other businesses selling traditional goods. And with beautiful spots such as this one, it is very easy to forget that you are actually in the middle of a major metropolitan destination. A required stop, of course, is El Parian, which is a historic stru a structure that is a block size. <clears throat> as it's, It covers an entire block. That's what I'm trying to say. And it's a tourist attraction because all of it consists of restaurants that are next to one another. So I think there is a Guinness record out there for El Parian for being the largest cantina in the world. But of course, it's not only about the drinking. Inside, there's a beautiful courtyard that provides plenty of places to sit and enjoy traditional Mexican food with live entertainment provided by mariachi bands and traditional dancers. Like many towns in, Tlaque, in, in Mexico, Tlaquepaque has its own main plaza and many, many places that I'm looking forward to exploring as I've only been there for a few hours at a time. This being the first time that we actually spend the night in Tlaquepaque will afford us some nighttime and some early morning exploration. But of course, the main purpose of the trip is to attend a performance at the Santander Performing Arts Center. This time around, it is going to be a screened performance, a live screening of the Metropolitan Opera's production of Dead Man Walking, which is broadcast from New York City. It is a new production for 
the Metropolitan Opera, and it's been getting rave, rave reviews. Of course, it's a contemporary work. It was composed by Jake Heggie, and it is based on the book by Sister Mary Prejean, who visits uh, death row inmates. And we there was a movie made from the book, which stars Susan Sarandon and Sean Penn, if I recall. And it is a very, very beautiful work. And it's getting, again, it's getting really, really good reviews. So what do I have planned for you on this pre-recorded broadcast? Aside from letting you know where I'm going to be hiding. Well, we just went through Dia de la Raza, or October 12th. North of the border, it is known as Columbus Day. It is the day in which Columbus discovered America. And, uh, and that's all fine and dandy. That's the way I remember the date when I went to school and I was a kid. That's the way it was taught to me. But of course, October 12th has gained a completely new meaning in, late, in the latest years because of the fact that the Spanish came here to take over. So <clears throat> it's not so much a date anymore to commemorate Columbus, but to, com to raise awareness of the fact that indigenous races that were living here were deprived of their independence. So take a look at this so that you can see how the celebration has changed through the years. October 12th, Day of Indigenous Resistance. More than five centuries after the discovery of America, October 12th is commemorated as the day of the race in memory of the struggle that the indigenous people and Spanish colonizers waged in 1492 after the Genoese sailor Christopher Columbus discovered the New World. This day was so named due to the intermingling that arose from the encounter between these two very different cultural groups on one hand, the Spanish white race, and on the other, the indigenous race, thereby initiating the union between Europe and America, also known as the meeting of two worlds. It's important to remember that because Columbus believed he had reached the Indies, not the American continent, these new lands were named accordingly, and their inhabitants were called Indians. Both designations were used after the gestation of the European colonization of America, which lasted for 300 years until the end of the colonial period. Today, few countries still celebrate October 12th as an allusion to the Hispanic American race or culture that emerged in the 16th century due to conquest. The changes in nomenclature are closely related to the social and historical reflection of populations and largely depend on how Christopher Columbus is perceived in each country. In recent years, like many countries in Latin America, this date has been marked as the Day of Indigenous Resistance. From north to south of the continent, indigenous peoples assert their territorial and agricultural rights and defend their natural resources, lands, cultural identities, languages, and self-determination. Therefore, October 12th has transitioned from the traditional day of the race to a day of struggle and advocacy for indigenous peoples. On this day, various demonstrations take place throughout Latin America and Mexico to commemorate the day of indigenous resistance, recognizing the perseverance, the fight for their dignity, and the cultural and human diversity of the continent's indigenous peoples. Thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe to Coffee and Headlines so you won't miss out on any content. How about that? Even PETA got a voice upgrade. My personal inflatable digital assistant has gotten a new voice. It still struggles a little bit with some Spanish words, but you know, what are you going to do? So that's one of two features that I prepared for you on this pre-recorded edition of Coffee and Headlines. The second one has to do with reading. I hope you are a reader out there and uh, that you enjoy reading books uh, because books provide an excellent opportunity to get to know. Let me set this up. Uh, -pa -pa -pum -pa. Okay. Books provide an excellent opportunity for us to learn more about Mexico, present Mexico, and past Mexico. What I did for this one is I went looking for 
a handful of really extraordinary literary works produced in Mexico by mostly Mexican writers that show us a glimpse of our history, our way of life, and that are available in English for you to explore, and even more specifically, that you can find in the Amazon.com bookstore. Take a look. Discovering Mexico Through Its Literature Are you an avid reader looking to learn more about Mexico's history and culture through literary works of fiction? Here are eight essential novels that are available in English on Amazon.com in no particular order. Pedro Paramo by Juan Rulfo Juan Rulfo was a renowned Mexican writer celebrated for his significant contributions to Mexican literature, particularly in the genres of short stories and novels. His work is often associated with the magical realism and existentialism movements. Rulfo's writing style is characterized by its sparse and evocative prose, as well as its exploration of the human condition, often in the context of rural Mexican life. His works have had a profound impact on contemporary literature, influencing authors like Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Carlos Fuentes. Pedro Paramo is a complex and enigmatic novel that weaves together multiple narrative voices and timelines. The story is set in a fictional, desolate town called Comala in rural Mexico. The novel follows Juan Preciado, who, upon his mother's deathbed, promises to visit Comala and seek out his father, Pedro Paramo. He arrives in the ghostly, dilapidated town and soon realizes that Comala is a place where the living and the dead coexist, blurring the lines between reality and the afterlife. As Juan Preciado delves into the town's history, he uncovers the tragic and haunting story of Pedro Paramo and the town's inhabitants. Pedro Paramo is a novel that continues to captivate readers and scholars alike. Its innovative narrative techniques, deep exploration of existential themes, and its role in popularizing magical realism have solidified its status as a classic in world literature. Juan Rulfo's work in this novel has had a lasting impact on the literary landscape, making it a must-read for those interested in Latin American literature and the development of the magical realist genre. Plus, you'll want to read it before Netflix wraps up production of its own mini-series of the novel, which began on May 2023. Like Water for Chocolate by Laura Esquivel. Laura Esquivel is a Mexican author and screenwriter best known for her acclaimed novel, Like Water for Chocolate. Born on September 30, 1950 in Mexico City, she has made significant contributions to contemporary Mexican literature. Her writing style and storytelling have resonated with readers around the world, her contributions to Mexican and Latin American literature have earned her a prominent place in contemporary literary circles, and her work continues to be celebrated for its unique blend of magic, emotion, and tradition. Like Water for Chocolate is a 20th century Mexican tale featuring Tita de la Garza, an accomplished cook forbidden to marry by her mother, Mama Elena. Tita loves Pedro, who marries her sister Rosora to stay close, each chapter matches a month and a Tita-prepared recipe, wherein her emotions influence the diners with dramatic and magical results. Amid the Mexican Revolution, the novel explores Tita's life and complex family dynamics. Like Water for Chocolate is considered a seminal work of contemporary Mexican literature. Its fusion of magical realism, themes of love and empowerment, and the art of cooking has made it a beloved and enduring classic. The novel's impact extends beyond literature into the realms of film, theater, and culinary arts, reflecting its cultural significance and enduring popularity. Laura Esquivel's book remains a testament to the power of storytelling and its ability to transcend cultural boundaries. Cartuccio by Nelly Campobello Nelly Campobello was a Mexican writer and dancer born on November 7, 1909 in Villa Ocampo, Durango, Mexico, and she passed away on July 9, 1986. She is primarily recognized for her significant contributions to Mexican literature, particularly for her novel Cartucho, which is considered a classic work of Mexican revolutionary literature. 
She grew up in the midst of the Mexican Revolution, which greatly influenced her writing. She was known not only as a writer, but also as a talented dancer and choreographer. Campobello's early exposure to the revolutionary events and her close connection to the soldiers and the experiences of women during the revolution deeply informed her literary work. Cartucho is a collection of vignettes, each presenting a snapshot of life during the Mexican Revolution, 1910-1920, from the point of view of Nellie Campobello, who was a young girl at the time. The stories are written in a fragmented and impressionistic style, reflecting the chaos and uncertainty of the era. The novel is characterized by its focus on the experiences and emotions of women and children caught in the crossfire of the revolution. Cartucho stands as a significant and enduring work in Mexican literature, offering a poignant and intimate portrayal of the Mexican Revolution. Through its focus on the experiences of women and children, its historical authenticity, and its innovative narrative style, the novel has earned its place as an essential text for understanding the human dimension of this pivotal period in Mexican history. Nelly Campobello's work continues to be celebrated for its literary and historical importance, shedding light on the impact of war on individuals and families. Beauty Salon by Mario Bellatine. Mario Bellatine is a contemporary Mexican writer known for his innovative and experimental works of fiction. He was born on July 23, 1960 in Mexico City, Mexico. He grew up in a middle-class family and attended the University of Mexico where he studied literature and journalism. Bellatine is widely recognized for his unconventional and avant-garde approach to storytelling. He is known for pushing the boundaries of narrative structure and experimenting with different forms of literature. His works often incorporate elements of surrealism and engage with complex philosophical themes. Beauty Salon or Salon de Belleza in Spanish is a concise yet highly impactful work that explores themes of illness, identity, and human connection. Its short meditative narrative revolves around the life of the protagonist, a hairdresser who runs a small beauty salon in a Mexican town. The beauty salon serves as a space for clients who are terminally ill, primarily individuals suffering from a mysterious disfiguring disease that causes the deformation of their faces. Beauty Salon is celebrated as a powerful and thought-provoking work of fiction that challenges preconceptions about beauty and the human condition. Its brevity, combined with its deep emotional resonance and philosophical depth, makes it a significant and enduring literary work. Mario Bellatine's novella continues to be studied and admired for its exploration of empathy and its profound insights into the human experience. The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. Sandra Cisneros is an acclaimed American writer known for her contributions to contemporary American literature, particularly in the realms of fiction, poetry, and essays. She was born on December 20, 1954, in Chicago, Illinois, USA. She is of Mexican-American heritage, and her upbringing in a working-class Mexican-American neighborhood greatly influenced her writing. The House on Mango Street is a significant work in American literature, focusing on the life and experiences of a young Latina girl growing up in a working-class neighborhood. The novel is narrated by Esperanza Cordero, a young Mexican-American girl living in a poor Chicago neighborhood. Throughout the novel, Esperanza encounters the challenges, joys, and complexities of adolescence. She witnesses the lives of those around her, including friends and family members, and she grapples with issues of identity, gender, cultural heritage, and socioeconomic disparities. Despite the hardships, Esperanza maintains her hope and desire for a brighter future. Sandra Cisneros' The House on Mango Street is an enduring and influential work in American literature. Its themes of identity, culture, and the immigrant experience continue to resonate with readers and its narrative style and cultural significance have solidified its status as an essential text in contemporary literature. The novel's impact extends beyond the literary realm as it continues to be a source of inspiration and discussion in educational and social contexts. The Labyrinth of Solitude by Octavio Paz
Octavio Paz was a renowned Mexican writer, poet, and diplomat, widely regarded as one of the most important figures in 20th century Mexican and world literature. He was born on March 31, 1914, in Mexico City, Mexico. He came from a prominent Mexican family, and his father was a lawyer and journalist. His writing was characterized by its intellectual depth, philosophical exploration, and a strong sense of Mexican identity. He explored themes such as love, time, and existence in his poetry and essays. Octavio Paz received numerous awards and honors throughout his lifetime, including the Cervantes Prize, the Neustadt International Prize for Literature, and the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1990. The Nobel Committee recognized him for his impassioned writing and wide-ranging intellectual contributions. The Labyrinth of Solitude, or El Laberinto de la Soledad in Spanish, is a profound and influential exploration of Mexican identity, culture, and the complexities of the Mexican psyche. The book consists of a collection of essays and reflections that delve into the essence of Mexican identity and the historical, cultural, and psychological factors that have shaped the Mexican people. Octavio Paz, drawing from his deep understanding of Mexican history and culture, examines the unique character of Mexican society and the tensions that exist within it. These essays explore topics such as solitude, identity, the role of religion, the national character, and the complex relationship between Mexico and the United States. Octavio Paz's The Labyrinth of Solitude is a cornerstone of Mexican literature and cultural analysis. It continues to be studied and celebrated for its intellectual depth, its impact on Mexican and Latin American identity discussions, and its ability to provoke thought about the complexities of human existence and societal identity. This landmark work remains a pivotal reference for anyone seeking a deeper understanding of Mexican culture and the broader concepts of identity and solitude. Massacre in Mexico by Elena Poniatowska Elena Poniatowska is a celebrated Mexican writer and journalist known for her contributions to literature and her commitment to social justice. Born on May 19, 1932 in Paris, France, she hails from a Polish-French noble family but has spent the majority of her life in Mexico. She moved to Mexico City in 1943 and has since considered Mexico her home. Poniatowska's work characterized by its social consciousness and deep empathy for the struggles of ordinary people, has made her a key figure in Mexican literature and journalism. Her writings are marked by a commitment to telling the stories of those who are often marginalized or voiceless, which has had a profound impact on Mexican society and literature. Massacre in Mexico, or La Noche de Tlatelolco in Spanish, is a crucial and impactful literary work that chronicles the 1968 Tlatelolco student protests and the tragic events of the Tlatelolco massacre in Mexico City. The book is based on interviews with witnesses, survivors, and participants, and it incorporates newspaper articles, speeches, and manifestos. It provides a comprehensive perspective on the student movement and the government's violent response. The narrative unfolds through the voices of those who were directly involved in the protests, creating a multidimensional and emotionally charged portrayal of the period. It captures the hopes, fears, and determination of the student activists, as well as the brutality and repression they faced. Massacre in Mexico is a powerful work that not only serves as a historical record, but also as a moving and evocative exploration of the human experience amidst social and political upheaval. Elena Poniatowska's dedication to bearing witness to the truth and giving voice to the victims of the Tlatelolco massacre has made this book an important literary and historical work, one that continues to be studied and recognized for its enduring impact. Aura by Carlos Fuentes. Carlos Fuentes was a prominent Mexican writer, novelist, and essayist who made significant contributions to contemporary Latin American and world literature. He was born on November 11, 1928 in Panama City, Panama, to Mexican parents. He grew up in several countries due to his father's diplomatic career, including the United States, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil. This international upbringing would later influence his writing. Carlos Fuentes is renowned for his literary contributions, characterized by his exploration of complex and universal themes. His work includes novels, essays, short stories and plays, 
He often incorporated political, philosophical, and existential elements into his writing. First published in 1962, Aura is a compact yet enigmatic work of fiction that skillfully combines elements of horror, psychological thriller, and metaphysical exploration. Its surreal and atmospheric narrative revolves around Felipe Montero, a young historian and writer who, in search of employment, responds to a mysterious job advertisement for a ghostwriter. The offer leads him to the enigmatic and decaying house of an elderly widow, Consuelo, who wishes to have her memoirs transcribed. As Felipe delves into his task, he becomes increasingly entangled in a web of dark secrets and unsettling events. Exploring Mexico through its literary luminaries is not merely an academic endeavor. It is a path to empathy, enlightenment, and a deeper appreciation of a nation with a storied history and vibrant culture. These writers enable us to engage with Mexico's past, present, and future, making their works indispensable for anyone seeking a comprehensive understanding of this dynamic and diverse country. Did you find this content intriguing? Don't forget to like our channel to enjoy other features such as this one. There you go. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. If you're a reader, you probably did, or hopefully you did. You'll be inspired. And if not, maybe you will be curious enough to maybe consider, a lot of maybes, uh, consider pursuing these books. And of course, I will prepare show notes that will include links to the Amazon um, uh, store where you can find each and every one of those eight books. And this brings us to the end of this pre-recorded broadcast. As usual, I thank you for your support and particularly when it's time to take a little break, I appreciate the fact that you let me leave this stuff prepared for you to enjoy in my absence. Needless to say, tomorrow will be pre-recorded as well, but I'll be back on Monday morning with all kinds of stories to share with you. I hope you have a great weekend and I hope you will have great stories to share with me on Monday when I return from Guadalajara. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again on Monday morning.